Cool. So I think we'll just kind of follow the same kind of structure we've been following. Um, I'm going to give, we'll do like a five minute icebreaker to give everybody kind of a chance to join in. I saw there was a couple new people who were trying to join the session. So um, we'll see if they hop in, but uh, to kind of get us started, let me share my screen and we'll start off with, let's go desktop two. All right. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, indeed. Okay, yes. great. So um, tonight's question that we can share around the room or share virtually is, uh, what's the last TV show or movie you watched? And um, when I ask this question, try to do the one that you last saw, not the one that you would admit to watching. So um, I can definitely try. two different things. Yeah, there's definitely two different things. Uh, so last night, uh, last night we watched a little bit of American football. So um, we watched um, Oklahoma State play, was it Florida? Oklahoma State and Florida. And so we watched some American football last night. So does anyone want to go next? Uh, I, can, I can go next. Um, I came across a, a series on Hulu called Treadstone which is a takeoff. It's kind of a spinoff of, of the organization from the, uh, the Jason Bourne, um, Bourne ultimatum. There was a, it's kind of like a spy show, kind of a spinoff of the spies and, and the sleeper cells. And the thing is like, my brain doesn't move fast enough to keep up with those movies. And so I know I'm going to have to watch them all again, just to, just to understand what's going on. And then maybe by the third time I watch them, I'll actually be able to enjoy it. But no, it's, it's enjoyable now, but, um, but I always have a, I'm never smart enough for those shows. That's so, okay. That's a good one. Uh, Bruno, Sandra, Sandra, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, so last night we are still watching the Mandalorian, but it looks the same every time, but people told me that season two is good. And my membership to Disney will be soon to expire. So I'm watching The Mandalorian. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I like the, I mean, the first one, it took me a little while to get into, but I keep hearing the second season's the best, so. But it's always the same. It's not a big change. It's always, always the same. This is the way. Hey, awesome. So Bruno, what about you? I started to watch yesterday the series about Bruce Lee so yeah it's in the I am the third right now I think the second or the, or the third but I really enjoy it so awesome and then I saw um I saw Mansa joined in so Mansa we're doing just a quick five minute icebreaker um what was the last tv show or movie you watched mm -hmm. I I watched a Korean series, uh, which was based on these five friends who were surgeons. So I got a lot of inspiration for my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Movies and TV could definitely do that. So that's what, what was your PhD in? What were you going for again? Uh, so I'm doing PhD in ecology and evolution. So oh, I work okay. on plant speciation, biogeography kind of stuff awesome great way smarter than me so <laughs> that's awesome great um so i think this is probably everybody that's going to join so we're probably at the five minute mark already but thanks for sharing um you know these these little icebreakers get to help us get to know each other a little bit more so um so for us to get kind of started i'm gonna do some quick housekeeping reminders for you uh your video camera is optional but encouraged you know uh, the sessions are recorded so keep that in mind um if we need to slow down and discuss, just let me know. Uh, it's not gonna hurt my feelings. Um, most likely, if you have a question, someone else in the session probably has the same question. So don't be afraid to you know, raise your hand and, and ask questions where questions need to be asked. Also, if I get something wrong, please let me know. I do not consider myself the arbiter of all things R or, or our studio or anything like that. So just please, you know, if I make, if I say, have a mistake, you know, please correct me. Take time to learn a theory, you know, if you can uh, attempt the chapter exercises and then please plan on teaching one of the lessons. Um, I, through my experience, I found that it was very beneficial to kind of go through this. Um, some of the stuff I kind of already knew, which was good, but then some stuff I reviewed and I was like, wow, I need to brush up on this part here. So um, 
but I'm sure Ryan can facilitate that afterwards and talk about that when we get to the end tonight. So what we're going to discuss tonight is we're going to discuss two chapters. We're going to discuss chapter four, the workflow basics, some stuff that we're kind of some stuff to talk about workflow issues and then some stuff related to data transformations. And specifically what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about uh, these specific dplyr verbs and kind of what they do and kind of look at some of the syntax with it. So we'll look at how filter, how we can filter out rows, look at how we can use a range to arrange data, selecting, selecting columns by their names. We'll look at mutate, which is creating new variables. We'll look at group by and summarize a new calculation. And then we'll look at the pipe variable or we'll look at the pipe operator, which kind of helps us chain things together. So this is the roadmap that we'll go tonight. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, uh, chapter five has a significant amount of material. So I don't think an hour worth, I don't think an hour is going to facilitate everything. So I may not go deep in too much depth into all the examples and stuff, but um, uh, I may not go into too much depth with the, like the specific examples, but if you have a question about that, you know, please raise it and we'll kind of talk about it. There is some interactive component with this. I'll ask you to kind of do a couple exercises and maybe potentially share your screen with us. If you can, that's great. If not, you know, that, that's cool too. So let's kind of talk a little bit about workflow basics. And many of you are probably pretty familiar with some of these things. Um, some of these things I'll kind of give some tips from my own experience. The first thing is, is that R is just basically like a calculator. And so, you know, you can just use it for things like basic arithmetic, um, some algebraic expressions, all the way up to probably complex math. Now, I am not a mathematician. Uh, I will adamantly say that I'm not a mathematician. So if you're somebody who's looking for kind of those more advanced kind of mathematics stuff, I'm sure you can do it in R, but, um, you know, just kind of know that it is a calculator. The other thing that the book talked about was this idea of creating objects. Now, the first thing you need to take into consideration is that R is an object-based programming language. Now, I say that like I'm parading around like I'm a computer scientist and know what that means, but um, we'll kind of talk a little bit about kind of the implications of that when we, when we look at you know, R and assigning values to objects. But when you kind of read into some stuff, you really kind of see that R is known as a object-based programming language. So what that means is, is that we can assign certain values to objects. And how we do that is we use what's called the arrow or the assignment operator. And how you can use this is, is you can either type it with, um, you can either type it with your less than symbol and minus sign, uh, but you can also use kind of the, the the hot key for this, which is alt minus, and it will automatically put it in for you. Now, the book kind of talks about this idea that you, you can use the equal sign, but it highly suggests that you stay or you avoid it. Uh, it will work for you, but um, you know, the book really talks about trying to avoid using that equal sign to assign uh, values to objects. And so when you look at this, basically what you're seeing here is, is that what we're doing is we're assigning this value three times four to this, um, or we're, we're assigning this object three times four to this value X. And so when you look at this, oops, sorry. my question for you is if I put this into my terminal X assignment operator three times four, and then on the next line I type X, what do you expect R would return to me? Maybe you want to take a stab. It'd be the value of x, right? Yeah, 12. you get the value. Yeah, you get the value of x, which is twelve, and you can kind of play around with that in your own kind of console, your own terminal to see what happens. But that's what should that's what you should expect to get returned is because you've taken this value of three times four, which is twelve, um, assigned it to this value of x. You type in x, you get twelve. Okay. Um, and then what's really nice about this is that R provides for you this like window pane that you can see uh, the environment pane. And I'm going to share my, my, my R with you a little bit. Mine may be a little bit different than yours, but you'll see this kind of pane called the environment pane right here. Now, for some of you, if you're using the default R Studio, it will be up in here. 
But what's nice about this environment pane is that when you have specific objects listed in here, it will actually list them all in there. So if I did our example of x three times four and did x, I get 12. In my environment pane, we have this value of x 12. Now, this may seem like a very simple example, but when you have a bunch of different values that you're creating or different objects, this environment pane gets very, very helpful for you. Again, for the people that are using kind of the default settings, your environment pane might be in the upper right-hand corner. So with that, we're gonna talk a little bit about naming rules. And the one thing that I wanna say about this is R is pretty specific about how you name objects in R. And so, hey, Colin, yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I <clears throat> jump in with a question? Sure. When we're talking about <clears throat> object-oriented, um, I was curious about what the uh, what the other alternatives are. But if it's not object oriented, what's what does that mean? Like, what is what is what does it look like if it's not an object oriented programming language? And are there examples that we are familiar with that would say that would be like a non object oriented? That's a good question. And do we have any computer scientists? Yeah. With us? <laughs> the answer. For example, I, SAS is not object oriented. Do you SAS think that is SAS, not? Do you think that SAS is, yes, so you don't have object, you just use data table. And it, you. Pascal, I, I haven't used SAS in Pascal, a while. Pascal, it's a, a very old ling language that not oriented. Yeah. I think C, like a very, uh, very old language, C. Yeah, it, yeah C too. It, it's, a, it's definitely not object oriented. Object is more like uh, they already create some uh, functions and group them together. And when you call that object, it comes with a set of uh, whatever functions. But I'm not an expert. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I remember trying to research it and it didn't make a whole lot of sense, but um, maybe let me put, I'll put it in the Slack and maybe we can talk about it next week. Yeah, and so I, I, I just know that there's different distinct, distinct or distinctions between different languages. And so that's, that's as far as I can go. I'm sure there's somebody that can provide a better definition than I can for sure. Yeah. Let me see if um, I can get an answer. Yeah, you'll, you'll see it. Like when you read some of the stuff, that's what you'll see is you'll see like object programming language or R is an object oriented programming language. And so I'm just throwing it around as a repeat and I'm sure someone can provide that better definition. Um, so the book kind of talks about some naming rules. So when you're creating objects, there are specific rules that you have to follow. And so I'm gonna kind of just briefly run over these. I'm gonna give you some examples of what's bad and what's good. Um, some things, uh, when, we, when we talk about these naming rules, the first thing is that object names need to start with a letter. Uh, they can't start with a number. Um, I think they can start with a symbol, but it's just not good practice to do that in R. Um, but some symbols are invalid. And so some, some symbols are also special case as well. And so it's just always good to kind of start with a letter. Uh, so here's some examples for you. If you have data, avoid these and just use a letter before it. Um, the next thing that you want to kind of look at too is, is that when you name objects or you assign, when you assign uh, values to objects, you only want to contain letters, numbers, um, underscores, or periods. And so when you look at this, here's some bad syntax, better syntax. And so the first thing is, is, you know, you can use underscores, but the thing that's an issue here is, is that you're using the symbol of the ampersand. So you want to avoid using stuff like that. Um, also, too, um, like if you want to use periods in between different words, you can do that as well. Uh, you can do things like this where you can do flights underscore data underscore two, which is OK. It's valid. Um, I would say it's not good form because it's not very descriptive. So if you're doing lots of analysis and then you get down to the end and you have flights data two and you go look at it and you're like, what does this mean? It's not very good. Another thing is, like I said before, is just use descriptive me uh, use descriptive names. So that flights to data, it may not make a lot of sense. Say you put this this code away for about six months, you come back to it and you look at it and you say, "Oh man, what does flights to data mean?" And so, kind of think about your future self when you're kind of writing your code or you're creating your object names. 
the other thing is, is you want to choose a case and style and, and stay consistent. And so there are tons of different styles that you can follow. The book references um, three of them. Uh, so the biggest thing I can say about this, and, and I've been using R for maybe three or four years, on and off for three, four years. Um, I went back to some code that I went wrote about like two, two, three years ago, and I didn't follow this consistency in my naming. And I sit there and I say, man, I wish I just would have picked a case and a style and just stuck with it. And so the biggest thing is, is when you're choosing this kind of style and case is you want to think about, you know, how others are going to read this. So um, I'm fortunate enough at, at my organization that I have a team of people that I work with and I share my code with them. And so I have to think about, okay, they're going to be reading this. So I need to be writing it so that they can understand it. Another thing is, is that having this consistent style is good for your future self. Like I said, if you put your code away for about two to three years, and you come back to it and you're looking at it, you're trying to read it and it doesn't make sense, then you're going to be spending a lot more time trying to figure out what you're, what you're saying. Um, the book suggests using snake case. Um, I use snake case. I like using snake case. Uh, other people use camel case. You know, some people use periods and then some people, they just decide to not do anything, which I would say don't do that because it's kind of hard to read and understand what people are saying. So to give you some examples. Oh, uh, another couple, couple other rules before I give you some examples of this is, is that make sure that typos matter. So, you know, uh, the best way I can put it is, is that um, computers are great, but they just need a lot of help and they need you to be very, very explicit. And so any typos, any characters that it can't read, it's not going to like. So make sure you try and stay away from typos. Also, case matters. And what's really nice is I thought this quote from the book did a really good job kind of summarizing this. And I'm going to kind of read it is there's an applied contract between you and R. It will do the tedious computa computation for you. But in return, you must be completely precise in your instructions. So typos matter, case matters. And so the biggest kind of the one, the biggest thing that kind of pops up a lot for people when they first start doing this kind of object oriented programming languages is if you don't define something or assign a value to those objects, you're going to get this error, error object why not found. And that's basically it can't find it. That object is not defined. And so if you see this, this is a good kind of tip for you that you haven't assigned a value yet. And so the other thing is, is that, and I've come across this maybe about a, a year ago is you won't always get an error for a typo. So keep an eye out. And so we haven't really talked about these functions yet, but can anybody tell the difference between these two functions right here? What do you see as the difference between these two functions? Naming convention. It's naming convention. Yep. Yeah. What's the specific difference between the two? Uh, one is a snake. The other is pure. You're on the right track. You're on the right track. So the, the difference that I was looking for, and you're on the right track, and you're, you're mentioning case. The one thing that I was kind of focusing on is one is read underscore and one is read dot CSV. And these are two different functions. And so um, they both do the same thing. They both kind of take the same inputs, but they're both from different packages, which we haven't, mm -hmm. we've kind of talked about, but we haven't yet. But just this small difference between the underscore and the period, you'll get vastly different outputs. And so it may work for you, and then you won't find out your issue till you're later down in your code, but it will crop up when you start going back and looking at it and saying, oh, I should be using the tidyverse read underscore CSV rather than the read dot CSV. So it's very minor, but it's it's a big difference. And it's something where you're not going to get an error for it. And you'll kind of find out that you did this later on in your code. Uh, in this case, should it be good uh, better practice to, um, to specify the package at the beginning every time we are using a function with a yeah. two, uh, two dot? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, you're going to, well, that's a good question. Does anybody want to weigh in on this? Because I have a, I have a perspective, but does anybody want to weigh in on that? 
I don't, I don't have enough experience with, you know, sharing and reading code to know for sure. My initial thought is that, um, that you're going to, you're going to load the packages at the beginning of the, of the code anyway. So, um, presumably people would know which package, which, which packages are involved. Um, but then also, um, I, I tend to favor writing less and uh, maybe that's a, a bad trade-off because then, um, then it's not as explicit, but I would, for me, I, I would probably write without, I, I wouldn't specify the package name at the beginning um, because it would just be some additional code to write. But, um, and then you also know, like I was saying, you also know which package is involved because you would have it at the beginning of your code. But um, again, I don't have enough experience sharing and writing and sharing to know for sure, but that's, that's my thought. Maybe, maybe when you have the, exactly the same function, right? So you'd like to explicitly uh, specify from which patch you are, would like to use otherwise. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think it's context specific personally. And, and I think it also comes down to if you are gonna share your code too. Like I know it's more of an advanced topic, but when you're, when you're developing packages, there's that discussion of if you should explicitly um, reference the functions or what package the function comes from. Um, this one's a little tricky because I think read.csv is, is, uh, is, is from the utils package, which is automatically put in every session. And so this one's hard. Um, and so I guess uh, I, this was a good question and I think it's context specific and someone could probably answer, give a better answer than I can. But I think the big kind of example that I wanted to get at is, is that, you know, sometimes typos, they matter and you may not get an error and you won't find out later on and you'll be spending more time to kind of debug it. But that's a good question. I think maybe we can ask in the Slack or something like that. Um, so uh, I, get, I put some, I linked some examples in this and I'll pass this through a PDF later, but um, these are kind of some style guides that I have found. Um, like I said, I work with a team and I share code with my team. And so we've kind of adapted a style guide. Um, these are a little more advanced style guides, especially the ones for like the, the tidyverse. And, and I think this is Google's, I'm not hundred percent sure if it's official. I just found it online somewhere, but specific organizations and packages have created their own style guides and kind of explicitly say, this is what we want you to do. And so if you work with a team or you're sharing code, um, you know, take some time to maybe look at this and then consider, make some decisions on what type of style you would like to use. Um, here's Google's, uh, again, I don't know if this is official, but you can kind of look at it if you want. It kind of talks about their different naming conventions. And what's kind of nice is that you see with Tidyverse, um, they suggest using snake case while, um, Google suggests using what's called big camel case. So it's just kind of neat to see that there are differences, but um, you can kind of see those kind of more professional examples. Cool, does anybody have any questions about chapter four? Oh wait, calling functions. Um, couple of kind of tips for you. Give your fingers a break, use the tab key. So there's an autocomplete feature um, if you're using our studio. So what's nice about this is if you ever see this kind of drop down menu come down, you can use your arrow keys to kind of go up and down and you don't have to type out the whole thing. You can just tab things out. And so um, I can give everybody kind of an example on mine. Um, one thing that I do, and again, I'm in my console. Again, your console may be on the bottom left because mine's a little different, but I use string R quite a bit. And so what's nice about Tidyverse is they use these prefixes to kind of help you find, oh, I got a new library, Tidyverse, excuse me. And what's nice about this is that string R has a lot of different values or a lot of different kind of functions that you can use. And what's nice is, is you can do string underscore and you can go through and look at the different ones and see what they have. And say you find one and you wanna use it, you just tab it out and you don't have to type it. So give your fingers a break, um, use the tab out. It, it, it works pretty well. Uh, another kind of quick tip for you as well is, um, I saw this, I think we kind of ran into this last time too, but um, make sure you match your parentheses and your, 
quotations. Uh, I will I will admit that working with some students that I teach a class or I teach a class in this to some undergraduate students. One thing that they just run into a lot of when they run into errors or issues is not matching parentheses or matching quotations. And what happens is, is that you'll get this wonderful um, greater than sign and then you get this plus and plus. If you ever run into this, this is basically that you're just, that R is waiting for you to complete an expression. And so how you get out of this is you either complete your expression or you would hit the escape key. Um, my go-to is just escape it and figure out what's wrong with it. But does anybody want to take a crack at how would we fix this issue to make it actually run? There's something missing. We just put the parentheses. We just close the parentheses. Yep, definitely. You can just add a parenthesis to this line and it should run. Okay. So that's chapter four. I guess before we kind of segue into chapter five, does anybody have any questions about some of the workflow basics or any further discussion on any, any of those topics? I have a question about that ending parentheses. So when you get this plus plus like, like this that you have up on the screen, can you just add in the parentheses? Because I've, I've found myself always having to go over here to the console, hitting escape to abandon the whole thing, and then correcting it and type or kind of, you know, correcting it and then hitting enter again. But so I wondered if, is it possible to just correct it right there when you, when you get this, this error segment? Yeah, you should be sense. able to. Yeah, no, it makes sense. You should be able to. It depends on your expression, though, too. Like, um, I, I would suggest, uh, well, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, the short answer is yes, you can. Um, but, like, say you had a bunch of, like, nested parentheses in here and you're not sure how many you have. Yeah. You might want to escape out. The, the biggest suggestion that I have is um, I really don't use, for me, I really don't use the console to write, like, multi-line arguments. I always put those in like what's called a, an R notebook or a just an R file, because then I can go back, run it, check it in the console and go back and forth and debug and fix. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you can, but I would suggest if you're writing multi-line in the console, you should be writing it in an R script or an R notebook. But gotcha. um, that's, that's my suggestion. Does anybody else have anything, any suggestions? The other thing that I thought was nice, uh, if you'll maybe either go back to the previous slide or um, I, I noticed that it has the package name right next to the command name. So in those parentheses or in those braces, you can see the package name. I found that to be helpful to know if I'm trying to use a, a call a function from the tidyverse or from dplyr as opposed to like the base R. Um, I think that that's helpful so that you know that you're pulling it from the right package. Also file names are great for the tab out. Um, so file names are also great as well. So like read underscore CSV, you can tab out your files. When I figured this out, I was just amazed. So if you ever need to find a file path, you can use this, and again, this is just in our studio. You can tab out the file path, and you can look at it, and you can actually use it to find your file paths for things that you're looking for. They um, they have to be in your working directory, right? That's correct. And the other thing is, well, I use our projects, and we could probably talk about that later. But like, I use our projects, and because of that, it has it. It has my working directory set. And so, if anybody has questions about that, we can discuss that more. But that's kind of more of an advanced topic. But yeah, it, that tab out works great. Yeah, Sandra. Yes, and is there, um, I believe that there is some way to have the code to be checked out if we respect all the indentation, stuff like that. Um, is there a way to have, uh, to kind of to have uh, a package checking if we respect all the, indic all the indent to have the code um, easy to, uh, to be read with someone who like to have everything with the right indent, stuff like that? I know, I mean, I think you're, I think what you're talking about is a linter. Um, I think there, there is a package that you can use that. I think it's lint R, I'm not 100% sure. But I know there's some tools in, 
in the options, I think there's something that you can actually show your tabs and indents, but that's pretty much what I know. Okay. Does anybody have, does anybody else have any other solutions? Okay, so I think we'll kind of move on to chapter five. Um, just, just like a note, like I said before, there's just a lot of information in this in chapter five. And in fact, we only have about 30 more minutes. So I'm a little concerned if we're gonna get through all of them. Um, but, um, so I won't go into too much depth into each one of these, but we'll kind of talk about like broad strokes, what they do, kind of what's their functionality. I won't talk about specific examples though. Um, so really when we talk about uh, the, the chapter really talks about these verbs of data manipulation. And so I kind of think of them as their functions that help us perform some action with our data in some way. And what we're going to be hinging on and using is we're going to be using this package called dplyr, which is underneath the tidyverse. Uh, you can access dplyr, the, kind of its documentation here. Uh, it has those verbs listed, and you can kind of read this on your own. I, I've, linked, I've linked this for you. Um, you can access it. But we're going to look at kind of uh, five different types of, of data manipulation verbs. We're going to look at filter. We're going to look at arrange, select, mutate group by and summarize. And so um, the big thing to kind of remember that the book talks about is dplyr verbs never change our original data. So they never change our original data in, in any way. So we need to get comfortable using that assignment operator so that if we want to use a data set later on in our code, we have to assign that object, that data object to another value so we can use it later on. Now we'll talk about pipes and chaining it, but just re realize that dplyr verbs never change our original data. We always need to assign our data to a new value. Okay, so we'll be using the, the NYC flight data to save some time. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it, but um, hopefully you had a chance to kind of review it. Uh, you can use this function called glimpse. I use this function to kind of look at the different data types. Um, you can type glimpse flights. Make sure you run library tidyverse, library NYC, 13, flight 13 to get the actual data set. But if you want to kind of do some data exploration, Glimpse works pretty good to kind of see it. But in the sake of time, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. So let's talk about the filter function. Um, the filter function allows us to subset observations based on their values. And you can kind of follow the general syntax of filter up here, where we have filter, we have our data object that we want to use, and then we have our filter expression. And so when we think about this, we can kind of think of the example from the book. Say we have this data set of flights uh, in 2013 across the United States. We want to look at just January 1st of 2013. Well, what we can do is we can use the filter function to take out that specific subset of our data. And how we do that is we take our data object called flights and we use this filter expression to say, okay, look at this variable month, only return uh, the first month, and then day, day. And so you'll see what gets returned is, is that all this data should be represented with month and day with just the value of one, okay? Now, when I talk about this, there is, say we have some more complex filtering that we want to do. So when we look at this, this is kind of a pretty simple filtering, right? We just want to look at the first month or the first day in 2013. Well, say we wanted to do the first month, first day for Honolulu and JFK. Well, that's a more kind of complex filtering. And so we need to hinge on some different conventions in this filter expression to actually achieve that. And so, there's different ways to do this. So effective filtering is gonna require us to know kind of three things. The use of the comparison operators, which here's the whole suite of them. Um, if you're unfamiliar with them, these are kind of the ones that are available in R. Uh, we can also use the application of logical operators where and is and, the pipe is or, and then um, the exclamation point is not. And then uh, we also have what's called the, um, I call it the in operator. There's probably a different name for it, but I just call it the in operator. It could be maybe the in pipe, but this is really nice if you're trying to filter out a lot of different values within a specific variable. 
And so let's kind of, let's just kind of use a kind of an example here. And I want to see if you can kind of come up with an answer to this one for me. Uh, using what you know from the, the readings yourself, can you tell me how many flights were to the major airports in Chicago? Now there's two major airports in Chicago. That's ORD, which is O'Hare, and MDW, which is Midway, in 2013. Now see if you can write the syntax for that. I'll share my answer with you. Um, I'll give you maybe a couple minutes to answer this, but you're going to have to hinge on the use of this and the use of one of these logical operators to actually complete this. So take a couple minutes. Again, I'm looking for 2013 flights, the number, how many, uh, using filtering, went into Chicago, again, two airports, ORD, MDW. And then remember, there's, there's multiple ways to get this answer. Don't want to rush you, but I'll give you, give me a thumbs up if you got it. Uh, if not, I'll give you about mm, 50 more seconds. Don't want to rush you, but I also want to respect the time that we have. We got Ryan's got it. So I'll share my solutions with you a little bit. Uh, you can look at this and kind of compare. I'm not going to ask anybody to share their screen with us, but these are these are the two ways that I thought that you could come up with it. Uh, we could have used. Did is this what other people got? Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. So um, these are the two solutions that I came up with. Uh, again, I used I used a combination of using those uh, using those um, excuse me let me drop back using those comparison operators and then using I also in the second example used this in operator <clears throat> and so these are just two solutions that you can have um, they both should come up with the same and so if you know if you got the answer of this that's good um, if not, you know, kind of compare and see how you could kind of improve it to get the answer using one of these solutions. Does anybody have any questions about this example or some of the stuff that we've discussed in regards to filtering? This data set only have date from 13, right? Yeah, so uh, the data set only has 2013. So, I mean, if it was multiple years, so here's a good question for you, Bruno. Yeah. If it had multiple years, say it had 2013, 14, 15, what could you do to filter out just 2013? What would you have to do? Yeah, I, I thought it was multiple years, but we can just include common year equal 2013, right? Yeah, you got it, right? So you could do a pipe right here and do 2013. You know, if it was a multiple, if it had, if it was a data set with multiple years, right? Um, okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. Uh, uh, this. Sorry, Colleen, the quick question. So those logic operators, that's only worked for the columns, right? If you have a filter on multiple column, you can just use a comma. Is that right? Yes. Only if you're doing an and statement, I think. That's so right. if it's an and statement over and over again, then you mm -hmm. can. But in our case, we're using an or statement saying, hey, I want either this or this, you know, and so it includes everything, both for 
ORD or MDW. If you just have a straight and statement and this and this and this, then uh -huh. you can use a comma. So even for uh, the same, oh, okay, I got it, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, somebody confirm or deny my, I, I kind of jumped in there with, with some pretty heavy confidence, but am I right? Yeah, on that's that? right. That's right. Yeah. It's commas are the same as an and, and then the pipes, are the, you'd have to do it with a pipe to do or, and I imagine you could get yourself into a bit of a trick of doing like a subset of ands and a subset of ors and trying to say, you know, a couple of ors and combine them with, and also a couple of other ors and it could get pretty complicated, but yeah, it would be the. The, the commas would be the and um, equivalent. The other thing I I, um, I wanted to point out is uh, is that the double equal sign there. I don't know if you're about to talk about that, Colin, but I, I that tripped me up the first time while I was working on it on our studio a second ago. Yeah, so I this did. is actually this is actually W or two two equal signs. So excuse me, I should have clarified that. Um, so it's this equal equal here. Uh, so I tried this new, I tried this new kind of, or not new, but um, I tried to create my slides in one of the R packages and it kind of worked, but some of it's still, I still need some work on it. So yeah, definitely. These are double equal equals. So um, make sure you take that into consideration. So awesome. Great. Um, and like you said, there's like a lot of different expressions. Like you can make these super complicated, you know, you can have, there's many different things you can do. And I think I might have some other examples here too. Uh, no, I don't. So we'll move on to a range. Um, a range, and just we'll talk about this really quickly. Most of us are probably familiar with a range. If you know Excel, you can sort it by, you know, most to least, least to most, or in alphabetical order. That's basically what a range does. Here's the basic syntax. Um, you have your range, a range, take your data object, and the different columns that you want to arrange it by. Now, if you want to arrange in a descending order on some variable, you need to use descending, that function descending. And so just know that a range changes the order of rows based on a variable that you specify or variables. And if you do use multiple variables, just know that any more variables after that are used as a tiebreaker. And then always remember that any values are always sorted at the end when we use a range. And one of my examples will show that here. So here's some examples. Um, so can somebody tell me what's going to be the result of this code right here? What's going to be the, what's going to be the results of this code? And I'll give you a little heads up. Departure delay is, um, I think it's the number of minutes past the scheduled departure time for the flight. What do you think is going to get returned here? Maybe we want to take a crack? Not sure, but the most delayed <laughs> first. Yeah, you got it, right? So yeah. what we're going to do is what we're going to, it's going to take the flights data. It's going to take that column departure delay, and it's going to assort it how? Is it going to go from most to least or least to most? Okay. What do you think? Most to least or least to most? Most to least. I think got it. Yep, you got it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so that's because you're descending right here. Your descending is, is making it go from uh -huh. most to least, right? All right. So, so here's the example. And so you can look, and this is what you should get outputted. But if you see your departure delay, this value right here should be um, the most, right? And so this, um, so then the other question is too with this. If you notice, there's some NA values in this data set. Where are going to the NA values going to be when we arrange it? What do you, where do you think those NA values are going to be? In the end. Yep, it's going to be at the bottom, right? Um, so because it always puts NAs at the bottom. So the so here's another question for you. Can somebody tell me what's what's the result of this code going to be? Hmm. When the depart time is uh, not um, fill. Yep, you got it. So it's going to be the NAs are going to be at the top. And so um, 
so there we go. So you can see that this is the same data set with flights. Is dot na. It's only gonna it's only gonna return. Oh, excuse me. This is filter. I messed this up. I'm sorry. I put this as filter. So uh, this is actually incorrect. I'm gonna have to change this, and I'm now on recording. Um, so you can definitely see I'm fallible. Uh, there. This is a filter statement, and this is just filtering out functions that are na. So I do apologize. I'll make this correction. So oh, my no fault. Problem. Okay. Still useful. Still useful. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm useful. still learning. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about select. Uh, select subsets the data with specific observa observations based on the names of the variables. There's kind of your basic syntax. It's kind of just like uh, a range, but now, or it's similar to filter, but now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be retaining specific columns that we specify, specific variables. And so what we're looking at here is here's our data object. And then we specify what columns we want returned. And so um, it's not really useful for the flights data because I think it only has like 19 variables in it. But it's really useful for like data sets that have a lot of variables. And so, and from my own experience, I've worked with uh, data sets that had hundreds of variables in it. And so to continually take that, take that data set over and over and use it to try and uh, manipulate it. It's just not worth your time. And so I've gotten pretty comfortable with select because I can say, I just want these variables and I only want to look at these variables. And so it's really, it's, it's a really good function to use if you have a data set that has a lot of variables. So what's nice about this is the book also talks about helper functions. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to discuss all of these helper functions. But what's really nice about some of these, and, and I highly suggest reading over these and understanding these because they do help out quite a bit. And to kind of talk a little bit more about what are, what are some of the ways we can use select, um, these are kind of like the general applications of it. And I'll share some examples with you of using those kind of helper functions. But um, we can select variable names by, uh, by the specific name itself. Or we can do a range of names. So if we want to say we want to take year, whatever variables are in between year and day, we can take those, knowing that this is inclusive, or it will include both year and day. Or we can select columns excluding a range, which we can use this minus parentheses year um, colon day, and it will include all those outside of those range of variables. So that's, that's kind of like the basic syntax of it. Um, I thought in the reading, the exercise uh, 4.1, where it asks you to kind of brainstorm all the different ways that you could select these different variables was a really good one. It kind of was a challenge for me because I was like, okay, how can we incorporate these helper functions and how can we use these helper functions to actually do it? Um, is anybody brave to share with what they might have come up with or um, if anybody has one? I can share mine here in a second, but I want to uh, include everybody else to see, did you have any ways that you thought of doing this? I don't, I don't have one right off, <clears throat> but I was thinking you could do, there, I think there was a starts with, so maybe you do like starts with DEP or starts with ARR. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one. Yeah, so you could use that one. Does anybody else want to take, what's another way that you could do this? And it, then the and with? Yeah, uh, and with. And so, with the time or delay? Oh, yeah. So you could do that. Yep, that would work. That would work. <laughs> um, another thing that you could do, and here's some examples that I came up with. Um, and again, I'll share this with everybody, but you could just be explicit, right? You could just take the four variables that you want. Well, that works. Um, this was already brought up with ends with. We know that we have the ends with of time and delay. Well, we can do an ends with, with C, which is concatenate these two together, which is time and delay. Um, Ryan brought up the idea of starts with. We can use that helper function. I tried with matches. Um, does anybody know regular expressions? 
Any computer scientists, no regular expressions? I just got started on them. I don't have them down yet. <laughs> uh, they So basically, it's just pattern matching. Uh, it's a lot more complex than that. And so I, I, I know a little bit enough to be dangerous. But you could use this helper function called matches. And I think this is correct. But you know, someone could correct me or not. Um, you can also use numbering. Uh, I would suggest not doing this because it's pretty ambiguous because it's doing the column numbers. So like four, four, six, seven, nine. It's pretty ambiguous, but you can do it this way. Um, there are certain cases where I've done this, but I would suggest not doing it. If you can be explicit, be explicit. You can also use this all of where you can take your bars. You can set an object and then you can use all of bars and select. So. What is really confusing is sometimes you have to use a double cut and sometimes you don't. For you know, it's, I, I find it very confusing all the time when I do that. Is that sometimes you can use you you don't need to use a, the double cut and sometimes you need to use a double cut. Yeah. So uh, does anybody want to add? Uh, does anybody want to add to that? Does anybody have the same experience? I will say, Sandra, I do have the same experience myself. Uh, there are times that's hard to know. I always default to using a double. Um, I always default to using a double. I know you can use singles, um, but there are certain cases where you have to use a single versus a double. Um, in this case right here, and this might be a little more advanced than we need to talk about now, but you might have to use a double and then a single in cases like that. Um, but I always default to a double is the way I, I've, I've always done it. But yeah, there are times that you have to use a single, so I, I hear you. Um, so we're about, we've got about eight minutes left. Let's, let's talk about renaming and then maybe we can talk a little, oh, let's do, let's do renaming. Um, so renaming, uh, the book suggests if you're gonna rename, use the function rename. Uh, you can use select to do it, but just know that if you do rename in, in the select function, what's going to happen is it's only going to retain that variable that you've selected. And I've done this a couple times um, where I've done select where I've only wanted a few and I needed to change like three or four variable names and I'm only going to return those three or four. But the book really suggests use that rename function if you're going to rename column names instead of um, using select. Uh, so here's an example of what it would be. Uh, I always get tripped up on this. So I've just always kind of just remembered or try and remember this repetitively. When you do rename, it's always the new name equals the old name. New name equals the old name. And so in our case, if we're going to rename um, tail number, which doesn't have the underscore, we're going to put the old name here and then tail number. And if we run this, well, we should get a new data set that has that new variable named. So here's my question for you. If I just ran this code, would I have a data object that has this column name in it? What do you think? If I just ran this one line, do you think I would have a data object that I could use in further analysis? If that's clear, that's probably clear as mud. What do you think? See Sandra shaking her head no. Why not, Sandra? Why not? Because you are not supposed to allocate the object to what you want to use all the time. Because I did set this error all the time. I forgot to allocate. Yep, that's right. So I needed to use that assignment operator, so I would need to name this. So it would it would print it would print an output, right? The, you know, the, if I did this in my console or terminal, it's going to return something, and you're going to see it. But you can't do any further analysis on it. So, um, so yeah, it, awesome. it, it does not change your data set, right? It's just an output. Yeah, this yeah it's, yeah basically it's just an output. This does not so again any dplyr verb doesn't change your original data set. You have to assign a new value to that object that you create, right? Okay. Yeah. Even if you want, you can't change anything in using dplyr. From the way I read the book, and it was pretty explicit, it said it, it doesn't change your original data at all. 
is what I understand. You have to you have to assign it, right? Okay. Like you have to assign it to a new object. And so like if I wanted to have a new data object that had this kind of renaming with tail underscore name and tail num, I would need to sign it to like X assignment operator tail num. Is that clear? Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. I could share an example. Let's see. I could probably share an example here. Let's see. Like I said, I'm kind of running up on time here. So let me see flights. So if I did flights, names, flights. So if I look at names and look at flights, you would see that I have this variable named tail num right here. So for me to change this, I would need to assign it to a new value X where I did rename, rename, and bear with me, I'm going off-roading here. So flights tail underscore num equals tail num. I'd have to, swoop. column doesn't exist. So now what I have to do is if I wanted to look at this, I could go names X because I assigned it to a new object, tail name should be changed, tail num right here. Does that kind of clear that up? The original data set flights still has tail num without the underscore. Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah. So names, if I do names flights, still has tail num right here. And it doesn't change it. It won't change it at all. Any verb that you do will not change the original data set. So at least that's the way I read the book and so. Clear. Okay, so we're kind of, we're at about the three minute mark. And I think yeah. talking about mutate and pipe for, operator. For, be... for, sorry, for what it's worth, Colin, it, um, maybe we, you, um, we can just pick up, I mean, save anything that you have. I wouldn't necessarily rush through it. Save anything that you have and then we can pick it up next week and then just add on to, to that afterwards. So um, I just I don't don't feel like you need to rush through it, I guess is what I'm saying, because I think it's all really, really good and really helpful. Yeah, yeah, to be honest, I think we probably should hold off because you, we'll, we'll use mutate and group by and so, doing this kind of stuff. You'll use group by and summarize and mutate quite a bit. So I don't think we should speed through it. So I think we should table it for next time. I want to respect everybody's time. I don't want to go over the hour. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I guess I'll end with a couple discussion questions. Let's just do this last discussion question since we got about two minutes. What do you think was the most useful thing you took away from this chapter? What do you think? I uh, I was coming from uh, from a sequel, more of an experience writing in sequel, and so it was really helpful to think about these things in terms of sequel. Um, you know, like how do you, how do you do it in SQL, and then think about how you do it in in R. Um, so maybe there's other connections. If if people have experience with other programming languages, it, it may be helpful to also make a connection to what you're used to, and just see how it's done in um, in R. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else want to add to that? We got about one more minute left. And again, if you have to leave, it's okay. Um, but like I said, does anybody else have anything that they want to add? I had trouble working through some questions. So I'm hoping when we discuss those topics, I'll ask. Yeah, so um, if you, and I did too, because some of the arithmetic questions, I was like, whoa, I need to go back to my math and remember this. Um, so if you have questions before next session, put them in the Slack channel and we can kind of create a thread and then that will kind of maybe give us some time for some of us to prep to kind of think about those questions and, and bring them back to next session. So um, yeah, so Monsa, if you have questions, anybody post them on the Slack and then we can see if we can answer them and talk about them because I think that, that would be very helpful. So I got about 20 more seconds. So Ryan, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you and then you can kind of wrap up everything. Okay. Um, so it, it, we'll pick up here next week then, and Colin, I'll let you finish the slides that you did. Um, does anybody, anybody interested in picking up, uh, I guess, starting with chapter six? 
I can't remember how long chapter six is, but anybody willing to, to take on a discussion for the next time after Colin? Not yet? Okay. All right, I'll plan something for chapter six. Colin, maybe you and I can, can check in with each other, see how much uh, is left and how much time we'll have, and then we'll just go from there. So that's all I've got. In the meantime, I hope everybody is having a, a safe and happy holiday, um, that you enjoy your New Year's, and um, appreciate very much, Colin, for your preparation and, and for, uh, for, for talking us through all these. And other you than that, we'll talk to you guys next week. Yeah. If yeah. anybody has any questions, reach out on right. Slack. I'll be available. Thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Happy New Year. Thanks. All right. New Year. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.